live. Okay. Uh, welcome everyone to our fifth installment of the Botany for Beginners webinar series. I'm Justin Meissen and today I'll be co-teaching with Laura Walter and we'll be talking about um, identifying uh, plants and prairie remnants and uh, talking about um, kind of how we can uh, better understand prairie remnants. So as we get started here, um, I'll introduce myself briefly. Justin Meissen, I'm the Research and Restoration Program Manager at the Tallgrass Prairie Center. I work with conservation professionals, farmers, and other folks to um, improve prairie restoration through scientific research. Um, and in my field work, I um, spent a lot of time in, in prairie restorations, and I'm hoping to be able to share some of the tips that I've learned to help me figure out what uh, what are the plants out there and, and how we can um, know that we're in a, in a remnant. Hi everyone, um, I'm Laura Walter, your co-host for tonight. Um, I am the Plant Materials Program Manager at the Tallgrass Prairie Center. So um, what I work on is the production of seed here at the TPC um, for the purpose of getting Iowa source um, genetics of the, that seed into the native seed market. So um, that's uh, how my job brings me here. Um, but I have um, an, kind of a backstory in that I grew up in Kansas where I was surrounded by a Tallgrass Prairie landscape that um, I didn't come to fully appreciate until I was in college and graduate school. Um, and then moved to Iowa where um, the, tall, the, the Tallgrass Prairies were few and far between, they were small remnants. But what I noticed here is that the circle of people who care about those remnants is extremely important to them. And I'm hoping that by presenting this material tonight, we'll have to expand the circle of people who understand the importance of and appreciate those remnant prairies. Thanks, Justin. Okay, so we uh, also wanna thank the organizations that uh, have helped make the webinar series happen, um, along with the whole staff at the Tallgrass Prairie Center. We're getting support from Practical Farmers of Iowa, Green Iowa AmeriCorps, and the University of Northern Iowa. And in particular, I want to thank the following people who have really done a lot of work to make this course work as well as it has. Um, Paige Schaefer, Stacey Miller, and um, the UNI IT staff. So thank you very much. So a few course announcements before we start the part of the webinar. Um, we have the June 24th webinar posted. Um, we're going to be posting homework three pretty soon. Um, and uh, the last webinar will be on July 8th. That page will talk about continuing your botanical journey. Um, uh, if you've not taken the survey, go ahead and please do that. And then uh, keep, keep the conversation going over on the Botany Beginners Facebook group. And then finally, as always, uh, take a look at the Tallgrass Prairie Center website, um, in particular at the resources section that'll give, us a, give you a lot of um, good information about planting and managing prairies uh, and remnants are, are part of that. All right, so to start off, let's recap our overall goals here for botany beginners. So we want to help you learn how to learn plants. So throughout the course, we're focusing on learning the names of plants that you should know as an Iowan or someone who's interested in Iowa. Um, we also want to help build the vocabulary that you need to learn on your own um, using field guides and other botany resources. And through, um, through the course, I hope, we hope you gain a, an appreciation of some of Iowa's natural areas and the plants that define them. And that's certainly what we'll be uh, focusing on today. And then finally, we just want to help create a community of emerging botanists all across the state. So Botany Beginners is a course primarily based off of six pre-recorded lectures, focusing on important topics in botany and using plants of the day to help illustrate those ideas. Um, we're using Newcomb's Wildflower Guide as a text that we're working from in the course. So we'll be using that as we work through our plants today. Um, each lecture has homework and quizzes associated with it uh, throughout the course. Again, we do encourage conversation about the material in, in our Facebook group. And lastly, we'll also be hosting some virtual field days later in July that hopefully can cover uh, some of the topics that uh, we talked about um, throughout the lectures. 
So here's where we're at in the course. This is the fifth of six lectures, and next week, Paige Schaefer will be back to wrap up the course with continuing your botanical journey. So recall from previous lectures that we discussed some basic terminology when describing plants, particularly you know, we describe flowers as irregular or multi-parted, um, leaf types, um, leaf edges, uh, shapes of leaves. And we use Newcomb's guide with that terminology to identify several plants, but we also use other uh, guides like Minnesota Wildflowers uh, website. Uh, we talked about plant families and how each one has unique traits that can help you identify uh, species belonging to the families. And we talked about uh, a few strategies for plant ID without flowers as well. And then finally, we talked about uh, how we can use planting age and seed mixes as context clues to identify CRP plants. So today, we're going to focus on a couple things. Um, first thing we're going to do is uh, focus on learning how to recognize remnant prairies. Uh, we'll talk about how to find and explore remnant prairies. Uh, we'll talk about the risks that are present to those uh, remnants and how they're managed. And then we'll talk about the importance of remnant prairies and how you might be able to help or get involved in their conservation. Of course, we'll also be doing plants of the day uh, throughout our time. So when we talk about tall grass prairies and uh, remnant prairies, uh, what do we mean? Now prior to Euro-American colonization, much of the Midwest was covered in what was essentially a sea of grassland called tall grass prairie. So while the name might suggest it was mostly grass, in fact the vegetation is extremely mixed. It's got both a lot of wildflowers and grasses. And so this map shows uh, where that original tall grass prairie existed. And you can see it's stretched all across North America um, from Canada all the way down to Texas. Now if we zoom in on Iowa, uh, we see that almost all of Iowa prior to colonization was prairie. So our best estimates suggest about 80 to 85 percent of the state was covered by prairie or prairie-like ecosystems such as um, savannas, which are essentially tall grass prairies with scattered open grown trees. And you'll see that um, the only places that really were not primarily prairie were the river valleys and a couple areas in the northeast and southeast that uh, were mostly forested. But by the time colonization was complete, the, uh, the landscape was drastically changed and essentially all tall grass prairie was converted into uh, intensive agriculture. And so this is the extent of the original prairie today. That, um, so what remains is less than a tenth of a percent of Iowa's original prairie. And so this, that's what we mean when we say a piece of land is a prairie remnant. The piece of the original prairie that once covered Iowa um, with all the plants and fungi and bacteria that evolved together there. So when we talk about a remnant prairie, we're not necessarily talking about a certain set of plant species. So we will talk about some plants that are almost always only found in these original habitats. Um, when we talk about remnants, we're mostly talking about plant communities. So a collection of plant populations that have existed together in a location for, um, in many cases, uh, centuries or, or many, many centuries. So if you couldn't make out those uh, areas where the, prim, uh, the prairie remnants uh, generally still exist, um, it's not surprising since they're all so small to be invisible on the state map. Um, but if we light some of these up, uh, we can see the general patterns of where prairies or uh, remnants are located. You know, we still have some larger chunks in western Iowa, but more generally there are um, remnants scattered around the entire state. So pretty much every county has at least one that we know of or would expect to find. So why are these prairie remnants still here? Uh, why do they still exist? Well, the answer is almost always um, very simple. They were on land that was not suitable for agriculture or development. Uh, many of the remnants are uh, sand prairies. Um, they're on land that's too sandy to grow crops. And instead of uh, being uh, uh, used for crops or developed, they got used for pasture and hay. Other remnants 
were too rocky to plow and were used for pasture. Other remnants uh, were hill prairies, which generally were too dry and too steep to plow and grow crops or, or even build anything on. And again, a lot of those uh, remnants were also grazed. Uh, many prairie remnants were uh, are wet prairies, you know, fens or sedge meadows, which are too wet to grow crops and uh, were used for hay or pasture, and that's why they still exist. Uh, some small remnants are located in old pioneer cemeteries where the land that was reserved for burials um, was still all prairie. And those uh, old cemeteries are often abandoned but remain undeveloped and they created tiny protected areas for prairie to remain. So we talked about roadside prairies last week and those along with other rights of ways, um, like railroad rights of ways, or other spots where remnant prairies can be found still. Um, when the original infrastructure of railroads and roads was installed, there were often extra areas in between roads and railroads or on curves or intersections where the land was um, unable to be uh, developed. So while most remnants in Iowa and the upper Midwest are generally very small pieces in an agricultural landscape, there's still a, a handful of true tall grass prairie landscapes where prairie is the dominant kind of land. Now, if you've taken a road trip out west, you've certainly seen lots of short and mixed grass uh, prairie landscapes. Um, in contrast, it's this tall grass prairie landscape that's extremely rare. Um, so where are they still at? Um, one of the more unique landscapes is northwestern Minnesota's tall grass aspen parklands which is a very interesting mosaic of tall grass prairie and oak and aspen forests. Um, northeastern Kansas is home to the Flint Hills, which is one of the most intact tall grass prairie regions remaining. And uh, some smaller landscapes also exist, in, um, which include uh, Iowa's Less Hills in the far western part of the state, as well as the sandy landscapes of the Cheyenne Delta in southeastern North Dakota. And you'll notice that all these areas are on the far western flank of North America's original tall grass prairie. Okay, so let's do our first plant of the day. Um, now this one we won't be in Newcombs and um, we will instead focus on context clues about the habitat that it's found in, as well as some unique traits about its bloom time. So this plant is an example um, of one that's generally only found in rocky or sandy prairie remnants. So we know if we're in a wet or medium moisture spot, we don't really need to worry about encountering this. This plant's also the first to bloom of uh, pretty much any prairie plant. Uh, often it even emerges from the snow in March. Um, and actually, this situation that we're looking at here is actually pretty rare. Uh, most of the time we see the plant either as only a flower in the earliest spring or only as leaves later in the spring and into the summer. Um, and so this photo was taken in a very late spring where they both uh, coincided. So this species is called pasque flower or pulsatilla patens. And again, it's one to look for on um, dry, rocky, and, and sandy prairie remnants. Okay, so let's do a second plant of the day. Um, so in this example, we're, we're, we're walking through a prairie remnants and we've run into quite a strange looking plant here. Um, so let's see if we can identify it. So this time we will use Newcombs and the first thing we'll do is have a look at the flowers. Um, what flower type are we looking at here? Looks like five part regular flowers. Um, looking at the plant type, what kind of a plant are we working with here? A bit strange looking, but if we find the leaves where they're uh, meeting at the stem, we can tell those are opposite leaves, even though they're actually almost basically fused together. And then finally, we can look at the leaves themselves. Um, and so what's the leaf type here? That looks like entire leaves. Okay, so that gives us a group number of 542. 
And if we read through the keys, uh, what page number should we check? So if we look closely at the flowers, we see the flower parts are all separated. There's not a fused tube or anything like that. And if we tear a bit of the leaf, we'll find that it has milky juice. So we should go to page 262. And then what's our plant? Um, we've got dull brownish purplish flowers. So we'll want to turn the page and look there. Uh, well, these leaves here that we have are stalkless and clasping around the stem. So that leaves us with blunt leaf milkweed, Asclepius amplexicollis. Um, and this species is one that we usually only find in remnant prairies that are, uh, that are well drained. So we talked about um, how there are still remnant prairies out there all over Iowa. So if you wanted to visit one, how would you find one? Well, probably the most engaging way is to connect with other interested people via one of Iowa's native plants or prairie focused groups. So one, one group to check out would be the Iowa Prairie Network. And I've got a link to the website um, here. Uh, they're an organization devoted to promoting Iowa's prairies and in a typical year they host a lot of prairie hikes in all regions throughout the state. Um, in addition to that, they host various meetings um, where folks interested in prairies can learn and connect with others interested in Iowa prairies in the summer and winter. Um, of course this year is quite different. There's um, not really too many um, opportunities with the pandemic but do stay tuned to their website to see when uh, the uh, upcoming events are. Um, the other uh, organization to check out would be the Iowa Native Plant Society. Um, we've got the link here. Um, they also lead field trips. Uh, sometimes are, those are very focused. Um, if you're interested in setting out on your own to explore um, a lot of Iowa counties have publicly accessible remnant prairies that they manage or own um, and that are open to the public. Um, the best way to explore is to browse the parks uh, in your or a surrounding county um, and read through the descriptions of the land. So um, mycountyparks.com is a good place to start um, and then you can find your county. And then some of the keywords that you want to look for in, in um, kind of browsing through those parks are uh, original prairie, native prairie, prairie remnant. Um, often lands that are dedicated as preserves tend to be more focused on uh, plants and wildlife conservation. So um, you might find interesting things there. Um, you know, while restored prairies or prairie plantings are also really great places to learn uh, more common prairie plants, um, but you won't find a lot of the plants there that we're gonna cover today. And um, just a note for a lot of these, uh, these sites, uh, be prepared to explore. You know, these are, are lands that are managed primarily for bio, uh, biodiversity conservation and not for human convenience. So you are probably going to encounter all kinds of tough terrain or nasty plants on your journey. Um, another way to explore a remnant is to explore our Iowa State Preserves. Um, you know, the Iowa DNR manages the listings of these lands and you can visit the website here to find a PDF guide. It gives you great descriptions of preserves and maps and directions. Um, take a look through the descriptions to find the remnant prairie preserves. Um, now these remnants are on this list because they, they are such outstanding examples of Iowa ecosystems. You know, these are the places that you want to go you really want to see the best of the best. Uh, and because of that, um, because they're such special places, it's really important that we keep these prairies healthy. So if you do visit, make sure you leave no trace. Um, you know, be mindful of where you step and absolutely no collecting or disturbing vegetation um, of any kind. Okay, so now it's time for a quick botany break. And I think I will uh, turn it over to Laura for, um, since we are uh, not taking questions tonight. Yeah, I'll go ahead and switch over to my screen. Okay, 
here we are. So um, Justin gave you just an amazing introduction to um, the uh, what, a, what a remnant prairie is and how you can find some to explore. And so I'll be talking about some of the things that you might expect to see when you go to a remnant prairie and that also might help you if you suspect you um, might have a remnant prairie that's not yet been identified in, in your area. Um, places where that might um, happen are uh, include some of the areas that Justin talked about that have been used for pasture, for instance. There, there could be remnant prairies hiding in a, in a pasture landscape, um, as well as those uh, wet spots in a field that weren't suitable for tillage. Um, or um, sometimes even um, in the lowlands uh, near rivers uh, where forests have, have begun to encroach, but where there might have been a savanna type landscape in the past. And so there could be little vestiges of prairies, um, you know, hiding right under your nose. And we hope that you'll be able to recognize those when you see them. So this is a bit of an introduction to that idea. So when you first um, go out into a remnant prairie, one of the things I think you'll notice is just the um, incredible diversity of the plant life that's out there, especially as you started to learn how to identify some of them and some of the characteristics of plants, you're gonna see a lot of, of differences um, uh, in, in the prairie around you. Uh, there are about 1600 species of plants in Iowa and in a larger high quality remnant, you could see over 300 of those in, in that one place. The other uh, aspect of diversity that you might notice is that um, the uh, a remnant prairie has a lot of patchiness or heterogeneity um, as you as you walk across it and observe it. Um, this wasn't something that was seeded recently with um, you know a single seed mix or just a couple of seed mixes. This is something where the the plants have uh, adapted to that site um, and evolved in that site for hundreds to um, even thousands of years. So they have relationships to the soil, to the way water moves or doesn't move through that landscape. Um, and to the other plants and uh, even the, uh, the animals that live in that landscape. So in this uh, image, for instance, you'll see that there up in the upper left hand corner, there is kind of a distinct patch. Let's see if I can run my thing again. Um, there's a distinct patch that has a lot of kind of tufty sedges in it. Um, this um, little area of the Cedar Hills Sand Prairie in Black Hawk County has a couple of uh, areas where the sand had blown out in the past and it forms kind of cup-like depressions. Uh, so this is one of those little blowouts that collects moisture and, um, and in the, the bottoms of those depressions, you're gonna find um, species that uh, exist under those, those higher moisture conditions. As you move up the slope, uh, you start to see some, some shrubs and uh, other herb herbaceous species that um, uh, exist in kind of a, a more um, moderate uh, moisture regime. And then at the very top of that slope, um, there are several species that uh, you would see in a drier, sandier um, prairie, such as a little blue stem and uh, the, uh, the white sage and a pacoon. Another thing that you may notice as you walk across or even crouch down into a remnant prairie is that the stature of the plants isn't as great as in say a young CRP planting that you have, have visited before, hopefully you visited that for this course. Um, why could that be? Why would a, a, a native prairie be shorter? Well, there are a couple of things that could play into that. It, um, some of them are on those rockier, sandier, drier soil um, sites, uh, which could cause the same plant species to um, actually be uh, shorter in stature. It could be actually the species composition at that site that those are, um, uh, that they're dominated by shorter species. It could also be due to the competitive relationships that have developed amongst those plants uh, in that site. Um, some of those uh, plant competition relationships are mediated by fungi within the soil, or they could even be affected by um, plants that are directly parasitic on uh, other plant species. One of the things that really stands out to me when I'm in a remnant prairie is the, um, the vertical complexity of the prairie, that uh, you have uh, a much more complex understory in the remnant than, than you would in a, in a new uh, restoration, for instance. So there's, it's, it's almost difficult to get to the point where you can actually see the soil um, amongst the tangle of plants. 
you'll also see that there's a great diversity of flowers um, from early spring all the way through the fall, uh, whereas a lot of our restorations um, kind of peak during, during midsummer. So here's a, a little sample of the understory of a um, uh, blooming in the spring with wild strawberries. And here's a late fall um, uh, flower from the Cedar Hill Sand Prairie. Another thing that you'll notice as you go into those remnants is that they're going to uh, contain some plant species that you wouldn't typically see um, within a, uh, a restored prairie. So these are, we're going to call them remnant specific plants. Um, and there may be uh, several reasons why these species are not often found in reconstructed prairies or within um, remnants that have uh, lack management. One of the reasons they aren't in, in restorations could be that the seed is not available or it could be prohibitively expensive. This could be just because it's difficult to produce that seed um, for the market. It could also be that even if the seed is planted, those species are difficult or slow to establish um, within a restoration. And sometimes the reasons for those difficulties are not even fully understood. Um, though, once again, those the, the relationships of these to the, the other plants and to the microorganisms in the soil might be factors that contribute to that. Uh, they might also have very specific habitat or management needs that make them less suitable for uh, restoration purposes um, or also difficult to establish. So we have another um, uh, a brief botany break um, as I uh, head into the next se section where we'll be talking about some uh, more examples of some remnant specific plants. Uh, this particular photo was taken from right at ground level, looking up through um, a field of, of pussy toes uh, blooming in the early spring. This is a species that is kind of near and dear to my heart. Okay, so plant of the day number three is one of those remnant specific plants. Um, and we'll uh, walk through it very quickly through, uh, through the key. Um, so with the three classifications here, uh, if you look very closely at this, um, it's a little bit distorted because there's some, some raindrops um, captured within the, the, the cups of the flowers. But if you look closely at them, you'll see that they are like little five-part stars um, at the top. So we've got five-part flowers. Uh, when you look at the stems, you can see that the leaves are not opposite to each other or whorled, so they are alternate. And our leaf type, there are no teeth on those margins, those leaves are entire. So it gives us group four, uh, 532. When we go through the key, um, we can use these characteristics to find the page number. So the flowers are not yellow or orange, the stems were not jointed, the plants have white flowers, and the flowers are under three quarters of an inch. So we could go to page 200 in uh, Newcomb's Guide, but we're not going to see anything that looks at all like um, the plant that I showed you on the previous slide. This kind of tripped me up for a bit, but um, look really carefully at the bottom of the page of text and you'll see tiny print saying continued. And so we flip to the next page. On page 202, you'll find this plant that's called star toad flax. The, um, the illustration in this case looks quite a bit different from the plant that we saw. The, the leaves um, are more widely spaced um, along the stem. Uh, but uh, if you read the description, this uh, matches ours quite well. And I would say, um, I would uh, use the other common name for this. I'm a former high school teacher, and um, my students always enjoyed uh, using the term bastard toad flax for um, the name of the species. The other thing to notice about this, if you read the description on it, is that um, it's mentioned that it is a parasite. So um, this plant, um, it's green and it's capable of doing photosynthesis, but it probably obtains some of its, uh, its nutrients and energy from uh, connections, low ground connections to other plants. So it could be one of the species that's involved in making the, um, the remnant prairies appear uh, shorter um, and more diverse and heterogeneous than other uh, restored prairies. So here's the uh, fourth plant of the day those bright yellow flowers. We're going to whiz right through the key. This is also in group 532. It's got the five part flowers, um, the alternate leaves and entire leaves. And if we go to page 186, after working through the key, we'll find that hoary cocoon is um, one of our options and it seems to match this species very well. And I would agree with that identification. 
Now, what the what Newcombs doesn't tell you is that there are other species of lithospermum or pecoon uh, in Iowa. And in fact, there's one species called hairy pecoon that looks very similar to this. If you're out in the field and you're in an area that has both of those species, it really helps if you touch the leaves. The leaves of hoary pecoon feel somewhat silky. The hairs are a little bit longer and softer. In hairy pecoon, those leaves feel coarse and rough, almost like hog bristles. But really, you'd be hard pressed to find them in the same spot. So we're gonna go return to the concept of con context clues that, um, that Justin mentioned with the, um, the past flowers at the beginning. And here we have habitat clues. So even though there's a similar species, that species is found primarily in sand prairies, whereas the hoary pecoon is gonna be found more in black soil um, prairies. Plant of the day number five. This time we have a flower that has um, six distinct parts and you can especially see that with the, the stamens that are dangling down um, below uh, those petals or tepals. The plant type in this case is a wildflower with floral leaves. You can see that kind of in the main picture, but I've included an insect inset picture that has, shows you how the leaves are arranged in kind of a ring around the node. They sort of whirl around the stem. And the leaf type again is entire. So this takes us to group 642 and the key will take us to page 352. Now there will come into a, a bit of a complication in that there are four different species of lily on that page. So we have to kind of eliminate the ones that are not um, possible. First one we can eliminate is the wood lily because the flowers face in the other direction. So the, the lily we have is facing downward, the wood lily faces upward. So we can cross that one off the list. For the next um, uh, uh, elimination, we have to use geography. So the Turk's cap lily looks a lot like the lily that we have, but its range is further east and south. So we can narrow this down to the Michigan or the Canada lilies. And I'm going to tell you, I would classify this one as Michigan lily or Lilium michiganense. Now there's some, the taxonomy on, on the Canada lily and Michigan lily are a little bit unsettled um, and some people group them together and some people don't. But this, um, this one I'm pretty confident to say is Lilium michiganense. So for the next plant of the day, we're going to return to one of the techniques that Justin used in a previous lecture where you look at uh, sort of what's um, in front of you in the landscape and you pick out one thing and investigate it in more detail. So the plant that we're going to investigate in this case is this very tufty grass. Um, and you can see I've circled one of them, but you can, you can, if you look carefully at the image, you can see that there are several more tufts of this grass. For this one, we're going to go to the Minnesota wildflower site um, because uh, Newcombs doesn't include grasses. And at Minnesota Wildflowers, you can find a grass search um, option. Um, it's a little bit hard to find, um, and you'll have to go through a few clicks to, to locate that grass search key, but then you can enter some characteristics into that, and that will give you some potential IDs. So some things that we know about this, clearly it's very clump forming. Um, this picture was taken in in late June and it was not flowering. So it's not a cool season grass, it's a warm season grass. Uh, it has hairy stems. You have to look pretty closely to see that. Um, and also there's a little tuft of hairs right where the blade meets the sheath of that leaf. So it has a hairy ligule. Uh, when in the fall, when this thing blooms, it's probably starting in about late August, you'll see that it's uh, inflorescences, it's flower arrangements or panicles, which are arranged kind of like the diagram that I've inset there and they exist in a prairie habitat. When you put all those things into the Minnesota wildflower site, um, you're going to get a list of about 10 species that fit those criteria. And using the, the pictures and then the um, following the links to the information about each of those species, you can work through the process of elimination and find, find your grass. If you change the habitat to uh, dry rocky soils, um, you'll end up with only two options, one of which is prairie drop seed or Sporobolus heterolapis, which is what this, this grass is. This is one that's um, a little bit difficult to find in production. The seed is quite expensive. It doesn't last very long in storage um, and it doesn't produce a, a ton of seed. So um, this is one you're unlikely to see in a restoration. Plant of the day number seven is in this um, beautifully patchy area of the Cedar Hill Sand Prairie. 
Um, you'll see in, in this one, another reason for heterogeneity is that some of the plants um, in the prairie spread through underground stems, forming large patches or clones. And you can see that there's a, there's a large patch in this, um, uh, it kind of about a third of the way up in this, that's kind of a lighter green, that's a patch of Coryopsis. But within um, this sort of matrix of grasses and that patch of Coryopsis, you'll see kind of this pale gray colored plant. And I'm gonna pull out one of those. Um, and we'll look at some of its characteristics. So we're going to work this one um, through the key very rapidly. It's got irregular uh, flowers. Um, each one of those individual little flowers looks kind of like a tube where the top part of that tube is a little bit longer than the bottom part. The plant type in this case is our first shrub that we've looked at. Um, if you look at the stems, they are woody um, and branched and uh, the leaves in the spring emerge from the, the tips of those branches rather than from uh, below ground structures. So here's a little bit of a look, a closer look at one of the plants that's uh, coming into flower. You'll notice that the leaf type is divided and it's divided in a pinnate or feather-like way. Um, this takes us to group 154. We can work it through the key to page 106. And that takes us to a plant called Amorpha fruticosa, which in the illustration looks relatively similar to um, the plant we have here. But if you read the description, that plant is five to 20 feet tall. And even given that remnant prairies tend to have you know, plants that are shorter, it, this, this thing, you couldn't stretch this thing out to five to 20 feet. So um, we're gonna take those same characteristics that we looked at, and we are gonna go ahead and plug that into Minnesota wildflowers and the option that comes there is Amorpha canescens or lead plant. So you'll notice that the genus name in both of these is the same. And that's something that can happen quite a bit with uh, when you're using uh, newcombs, you might get your, uh, your plant down to the genus level, but you might want to double check and see if there are other species within that genus that might be um, here in this region so that you can be more confident about um, your identification. So, and uh, with that, we are ready for another botany break, and I believe we're ready to turn it over to Justin. Oh, wait, no, we're not. It's still me. <laughs> okay, go figure. I need to check my notes more often. So I will go ahead and share screen again. I guess I just thought I was starting to get thirsty, and so it must be time for me to take a break. So here's my botany break. Done with that. Let's move on. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about um, what to expect and to do um, when you're out exploring those remnant prairies that Justin showed you how to find. So one of the things he mentioned was that you can expect all kinds of different vegetation types and that these uh, many of these remnant prairie sites are not set up with, um, you know, paved or, or uh, even soft trails for, for your exploration comfort, um, but you might be doing some, um, some a bit of trekking. So the first thing is to just uh, gear up for um, what uh, you might encounter. Um, I strongly recommend wearing long pants and sturdy shoes, and if the area might at all be wet, uh, either waterproof shoes or ones that you don't care deeply about um, would be a good idea. High heels are definitely not recommended. Another thing that you could do to help prevent um, problems with, um, uh, well, not insects, but arthropods and um, ticks uh, getting under your clothing is to do what this gentleman has done, which is to tuck his, um, his pant legs into his socks. Um, that forces the ticks to move on the outside of your clothing as, and hopefully you'll see them. He's also worn light colored pants. It's another great idea for um, dealing with ticks. The sturdy pants help you deal with any kind of prickly or thorny vegetation vegetation that you might encounter. You want to bring along water, especially in this time of season and other season appropriate gear, like, um, like sunscreen um, or bug spray. I'd also recommend taking along a friend um, or having your phone charged up uh, and checking to see if you have service just in case of emergency. And I want to point out that in the back of this image, you'll see that there's a fence line. Um, make sure that you know where the property boundaries are and stay on the public, publicly accessible part or if it's private property that you have um, permission to be on it. Also, as, as Justin mentioned, um, we want to preserve the biodiversity of these sites. Uh, so if you would please explore gently, um, watch where you're stepping. And uh, when you find something of interest, please take photos um, and leave the plants where they're growing. 
I remember that Paige gave some excellent instructions on how to take um, photos of the, the parts of the plants that you'll need for identification. And I think those of you who've been participating in the Facebook group have, have learned some further pointers on uh, um, how to get those pictures uh, to get you a good idea. I'd also um, encourage you, if you're, if you're geared up properly, if you can be comfortable and looking very closely at things, even hunkering down uh, next to a plant that you're interested in and cracking open your newcombs and keying it out right there in the field, just as uh, Laura Jackson's doing right here. Don't just look. Uh, you can use uh, other senses to help you identify plants. Um, in this image, she's uh, sniffing the, a, a little a bit of, um, of a plant that she's, she's plucked. This was a, a plant growing in a, a restored area um, and taking a little sample like that um, is not going to harm that plant. She's rubbed that and is sniffing that in order to um, see if that might be a species of mountain mint. Uh, I'd also encourage you to feel the plant. Sometimes the, the texture of leaves uh, can be a clue as to what they are. Um, this is something that I use frequently when I encounter plants um, in the sunflower family. Um, things like this compass plant have very coarse hairs. They almost feel like um, shark skin. Uh, if you encounter a, a similar plant uh, that's in the same genus as, as compass plant, it's called rosin weed, um, but it has leaves that look more like a sunflower. If you encounter that growing side by side with um, a uh, an oxide false sunflower, when you feel those leaves, they're going to feel really different to you. And uh, once you're familiar with those plant species and, and how they each feel, that can be a really nice clue to use. There's one sense, though, that I'd like you to be very cautious about, and that is tasting. Um, you can run across uh, some uh, extremely poisonous plants um, uh, in your native plant uh, journey. And for instance, things in the, um, the parsley family uh, can be pretty risky to um, to taste and some of them even to, to handle. So if you encounter this plant, water hemlock, um, I've given you the, the page number in um, Newcombs where you can find this. Do not taste any part of the plant. Um, it is the most toxic plant in North America and is um, uh, similar and both in its appearance in some ways um, and its effects to poison hemlock that killed, um, killed Socrates. My, my last um, tip for exploring prairies is don't just go once. Um, return in all seasons. Like I said, they're extremely diverse. They have things blooming from spring through fall, and you'll find something new um, every time you go. So uh, here's a, a shot of this prairie in um, early spring. You come back in midsummer and see how the palette changes. Um, this is in uh, late summer or early fall. You can see shifting um, uh, insect species that use the plants as different things come into flower. Uh, and then the, the color palette and the light changes as you move into fall and even into winter. And you know, all of these images were taken at the same place at the Cedar Hill Sanctuary. So now we really do have that botany break uh, where I'm gonna turn it over to Justin um, to talk about the risks uh, to prairies and how they're managed. Thanks, Justin, for dealing with my little whoopsie. All right, thank you, Laura. Um, so, um, so far today we've covered um, a couple things, how to recognize remnants, how to find and explore them. So now let's talk about some of the risks that prairie remnants face and how we can manage those risks. Now, one of the most common risks to remnant prairies is shrub encroachment. Um, over time, shrubs like gray dogwood, willows, or smooth sumac can establish and grow into a prairie remnant, um, eventually displacing prey plants and eventually leading to a loss of, of most prey species. Um, you know, so as the shrubs reach their maximum height and grow in dense patches, that shades out the light loving prey plants. Uh, and unfortunately, as our climate changes, we're likely to see more precipitation in Iowa, which also generally promotes shrub and tree growth, which is likely to exacerbate the problem. But that risk can be managed with a, a regular biomass removal regime, either with prescribed burning regime, at least every few years, or with annual or biennial haying, um, shrubs can be prevented from displacing native prairie plants. 
So if you're visiting a prayer remnant and the ground is black or the prayer has been cut and bailed, that's usually a good sign that steps are being taken to keep that prey healthy. Um, another common risk encountered by prey remnants is cool season grass invasion. Um, similar to shrub encroachment, introduced cool season grasses can displace prey plants if they become dense enough. Um, ultimately, that means a loss of many native prey plants as well as a change in habitat structure. Uh, much like managing the risks from shrub encroachment, uh, the risk can be managed with prescribed fire. So by using spring prescribed burns uh, about every three years or so, the risk of cool season grasses displacing native plant populations is lower, uh, though that frequency may need to increase where the uh, invasions are, are more serious. So here are the two of the most problematic cool season grass invaders of prairie remnants. Uh, the first one, smooth brome, uh, we covered that one last week. Uh, and if you recall, uh, one of its key characteristics is the M indentation in the leaf. And uh, you're most likely to find brome in medium to dry soils. Now in wetter habitats, weed canary grass is a common invasive cool season grass. Um, this is a robust grass with large papery ligules, um, which is the fringe of tissue where the leaf meets the stem. And if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing at the ligule right here. Um, and so um, another thing that the reed canary grass has is a relatively wide uh, stout leaf blades. Um, another uh, risk to remnant prairies is altered hydrology. And that can mean tile drainage, tile drainage outlets, uh, ditching, and flooding. So basically, if the remnant experiences significantly wetter or drier conditions than it evolved in over long periods of time, that changes uh, those. Uh, that leads to changes in habitat conditions that no longer supports the plants that are there, uh, and ultimately that means those po plant populations die out. So as climate changes, we also expect some changes in hydrology um, related, especially to flooding and uh, that flooding will become more intense and frequent, which uh, will put a lot of stress on a lot of prey remnants in risk and at-risk areas like floodplains. Um, now this is a tough risk to manage and the only real solution is often to try to expand the habitat around a remnant to make it possible for plant populations to move into drier or wetter areas as conditions change. Um, now we talked about several risks related to not having enough disturbance, but too much disturbance is also a risk as well. Um, in particular, mowing or haying a prairie more than once a year or doing continuous grazing uh, will deplete the stands of our long-lived prairie plants and eventually many or, or most of the species will be lost. You know, a lot of cemetery prairies and roadside remnants have been mowed um, to death. And uh, a lot of pastures out there that were once prairie have essentially been grazed out. But this risk can be avoided by moderating the grazing, haying or mowing that occurs. So for example, high intensity, low duration, rotational grazing uh, and conservation haying are both compatible with biodiversity conservation in native grasslands. Um, and again, the main idea with those techniques is to limit the disturbance to one time per year. Another challenge that remnants face, especially um, in Iowa, since so many are totally surrounded by crop fields, is from herbicide drift. So when herbicides applied to crops move into remnants, either with the wind or directly, um, that damages the plant tissues that are exposed and since many herbicides that are used are also systemic, meaning that they affect the whole plants, it can cause death even in mature plants. You know, usually drift incidents occur on the edges, and as prey plants on the edges die, those edges become susceptible to weed invasion. And while this might not be a huge deal in large areas, most remnants uh, that we have in Iowa are very small 
and the edges are actually a very large amount of the prairie um, in terms of area. So the management strategy here is uh, simply to apply herbicides in a very precise way. Um, you can do the last few rows with smaller application equipment like an ATV mounted sprayer. And then always, no matter what, use large, drop si large droplet sizes. Make sure the sprayer height is as low as possible and only spray in absolutely ideal winds and other conditions if you're doing that nearby a prairie remnant. Now, without a doubt, many prairie remnants still face a risk from development, mostly from conversion to crops, but also there's risks from commercial and residential development as well. Now, it's important to note that these losses are total and irreversible. Um, while we have made a lot of progress in prairie restoration, we are still nowhere near being able to restore all the species of bacteria, fungi, nematodes, plants, insects, um, and the whole uh, sort of web that is unique to tall grass prairie remnants. And that shouldn't surprise us since they took hundreds of years uh, or even thousands of years to assemble into their current state. So once these places are gone, they're gone forever. And when they go, that uh, all people lose all benefits that go with them. So the main mitigation strategy here is to protect them, either by using the economically in a way that's compatible with biodiversity conservation, or by uh, placing legal protections on them through conservation easements. And then the last risk that I'll cover might not come immediately to mind, but a lack of botanical knowledge is a huge risk to prairie remnants. You know, there's still a lot of them out there, but no one um, with the botany skills um, have necessarily seen them to say, yes, this is a prairie remnant and we should try to protect it as much as we can. Um, sometimes even well-meaning conservation projects can destroy remnants. You know, if the planners can't recognize remnant vegetation, patch of grass is a patch of grass, especially if you're out um, in the dormant season uh, making decisions. Um, and so that means an area is as good as any other for that wetland deepening project or flood mitigation structure that's gonna uh, tear up the vegetation. So if you own some land or know someone that does that might potentially harbor a prairie remnant, um, maybe it's never plowed pasture or that weird spot that's, you know, just been there near the railroad tracks. Um, learn to recognize a remnant and learn the important plants of the tall grass prairie, uh, several of which we've covered in this, in this course. You know, we do have a tech guide available on our website that uh, you can start with, um, but you can also reach out to botanists or prairie enthusiasts through a local prairie organization if you have um, identification questions. And with that, we'll uh, go ahead and take a botany break and um, we'll turn it over back to Laura. Okay, I'm back and live here and back to my winter picture. <laughs> Just can you believe it actually looked like that at one point? Those uh, sensitive fern fronds poking up out of the snow. Okay. And we are wanting to advance. Okay, so I just want to um, spend some time talking about the importance of remnant prairies. So Justin has has let you know about all of the, um, the, the risks and, and hazards that they face. And um, so I want to highlight some of the reasons why we really need to protect them uh, and uh, conserve them. So um, one of the first and most important for me is that they provide the genetic material for restoration. And Justin mentioned that we are getting better um, at restoration um, over time, even though we cannot recreate um, a, a remnant prairie, we can't recreate the hundreds of thousands of years of evolution in place that produced those. But we're getting better at it. And one of the things that allows us to improve um, on that is having uh, the, the source material, the, um, the diverse seed available to, um, to re uh, restore or reconstruct prairies. Um, here at the TPC, the program that I work on, the Plant Materials Program, takes small samples of seed uh, from existing remnants 
and then pools those to create uh, foundation seed that native seed growers can use uh, to produce Iowa source seed for restoration within our state. It's also used in um, surrounding states as well now. So I, I find that very uh, a very important um, reason for uh, for protection of remnants. The uh, the fact that we um, have a native seed industry that produces um, seed for restoration and that can rely on this uh, foundation seed that we produce um, also helps to remove some of the um, the uh, strain on uh, remnant populations from overcollecting. If we had to rely on remnants for all of the seed to do all of the restoration in, in our region, it would be um, difficult for those populations to sustain that. Um, and another uh, important reason for, for protecting remnants is that they provide us with a model of what we can shoot for um, in a reconstruction, reconstructed prairies. So we can look at their species composition, we can look at their relationship to the, the, um, the the, the site conditions um, and how they change over time and use that as a model for um, what we do. We can also look at the, um, the below ground um, soil structure and soil biology of remnant prairies and use that as a benchmark for defining what, uh, what healthy soil is um, in our area. The remnant prairies also provide habitat, even though they're small and can't support, uh, at least in, in Iowa, can't support uh, a bison herd. Um, they do provide a habitat for smaller species like small mammals, birds, uh, extremely diverse uh, arthropods, uh, including rare species. Uh, so that uh, is another uh, reason for protecting them. And I think it's, um, it, we would be remiss not to mention that they are just beautiful and a source of inspiration uh, for people. So that brings us to plant of the day number nine. Um, this is an early spring flowering plant um, also found at the, the Cedar Hill Sand Prairie. And uh, we can uh, work through the identification on that. The flowers are five parts, but they're clearly irregular. Um, it only has leaves around the base. Those leaves are very uh, finely divided. They almost look like weird fingers. And that gives us group 124, which takes us to page 34 um, after we've worked through the key. And on there, we find that this is birdfoot violet, which is Viola pedata. And you'll notice that a, a butterfly just suddenly appeared on the scene. And this is the, the regal fritillary butterfly and it has uh, two known host species for its caterpillars, um, both of which are violets uh, and both of which are fairly remnant specific. Um, and the uh, birdfoot violet is one of these. It's a larval host for the state threatened regal fritillary butterfly. So threats to the habitat of the birdfoot violet are also threats to the insects that it hosts. Um, management for uh, protection of birdfoot violet population sounds a lot like some of the things that Justin mentioned in his section. Um, careful use of prescribed fire um, is a really important part of this to prevent shrub encroachment um, that would uh, remove the habitat for that violet and therefore for the butterfly. So how can you help uh, if you, you know, when you can't actually go out there and, um, and uh, burn a public prairie or uh, manage it yourself, well, what, what kinds of things can you do as a citizen to help um, preserve remnant prairies uh, that you learn about in your area? So the first thing is get to, to learn about it. So get to know um, what the remnants are in your area using the suggestions that Justin had in the first part of this talk for finding them through the uh, My County Parks and the state, um, state preserves. Uh, and visit them often um, and uh, so that you start to notice the, the changes that are occurring in them. I also um, highly recommend um, the organizations that Justin mentioned, um, the Iowa Native Plant Society and Iowa Prairie Network. Join up with them. They can help you uh, learn more about those um, areas and uh, become involved in their protection. I would also suggest uh, making a contribution to a land trust. Um, Justin mentioned um, that conservation easements can help to protect these areas and organizations like the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation um, uh, help uh, landowners work on uh, getting those con conservation easements for those, um, those delicate uh, um, habitats. 
And then since many of these sites are uh, county owned, um, I think it's a good idea to become uh, involved with your county conservation board. And so I reached out with our local Blackhawk County um, Conservation Board to their wildlife conservationist to, and asked him for some suggestions about how people could, um, could help to preserve remnant prairies in, in our area. And I think these things would transfer well to other counties. So the first of uh, which is Blackhawk County has set up an endowment for natural resources management. So there's, um, you have an opportunity to donate uh, other counties likely also have endowments of that sort, and these then support um, uh, the management of these areas. And, and Justin mentioned all of the different management that um, helps to preserve biodiversity in them, and that takes time and money and, and people, and so you could contribute to that. Uh, also, contact your, uh, your county uh, conservationist and um, ask them if, if there are opportunities for you to be involved as a volunteer either individually or um, with a, a group that you're involved with. Um, say if you're in a club, like a Rotary Club or Kiwanis, uh, there's potentially group volunteer um, opportunities. Then um, finally, also find out when the Conservation Board meetings are, attend them. Uh, there are, there's probably a, a monthly update on the, the status of, uh, of the preserves and uh, you can go there and also show that there's public interest in preservation of these areas and become their advocate. Um, that it's important for the, the staff to, um, to hear that um, and then for that message that, that the public cares about these areas to get relayed to your County Board of Supervisors who then um, uh, has the purse strings on um, how uh, they can be effectively managed. Um, so today, uh, we've, what we've learned is that we've, we've learned how some plants and some characteristics that help us to recognize remnant prairies. Um, we've talked about finding um, and some things to think about when you're exploring a remnant prairie, some of the risks that prairies face and how those risks are managed, and the importance of remnant prairies and how you, um, as a member of the public, can help them. And then uh, we've had nine plants of the day. I think it's a record. I hope you've uh, held in, uh, you're, you're hanging in there still. Um, so uh, here's some resources that uh, we suggest for your further exploration of remnant prairies. Um, a book that I don't think we've mentioned earlier in the course is an illustrated guide to Iowa prairie plants uh, by Christensen and Miller. It's available through the University of Iowa Press um, and is a very handy guide to have to um, help you understand what you're seeing in remnant prairies. Um, I mentioned the beauty and inspiration that you can find in prairies, and I'd recommend um, this uh, lovely coffee table book called Enchanted by Prairie, which has images by um, uh, photographer Bill Witt of uh, uh, remnant prairies around the state of Iowa, and is also available from the University of Iowa Press. Um, once again, the Tallgrass Prairie Center Guide to Prairie Restoration has information about remnant prairies in it. It also has a lot of information about prairie restoration and prairie management also University of Iowa Press, and then our tech guide number four um, that is on our resources page for uh, technical guides. And I have a, a, po a closing poem uh, to end with. Um, on the sunset shore of the river in the land of the Iowans, the prairies lift and roll in pageantry of summer. With bee and with bird, the wilderness is singing, and the brooks hum low to the sweet wild grasses. This was written by Edwin Ford Piper in the early 1900s. Uh, he was an, uh, a professor at the University of Iowa, and he was known as the singing professor because he collected folk songs and would sing them in his classes. Uh, he was also a poet, and this is one that I had never seen before um, the spring when um, just doing a search for poetry about the prairies. And with that, I'm going to close unless Justin has any um, other closing comments. Nope, I, um, that's, that's what I got. So thanks everybody for, for being with us tonight. Yeah, likewise, we really appreciate um, all of the enthusiasm that you've shown for learning about prairies and hope that um, you really enjoy Paige's presentation next on, on continu continuing the journey. And um, I will see you on the Facebook page. Uh, I get on there as often as I can and um, comment and, and, and share things that I find. So um, um, see you all around. <laughs>